Welcome back to the second installment of Gonzo Gamer Ultimate General Civil War Major General Union Campaign on the road to Shiloh to take 12 two-star units. There's a few things I want to go over before we go to our first camp regarding the mod. First, you'll know that you have the mod installed correctly when in the lower left-hand corner you see JMP and whatever version you have. We happen to be using 1.27.4.3, which has been the latest one for the past year now. As far as finding the mod files so you can make any changes to your own game, the pathway I have shown here is for Galaxy of Games. I know a lot of people are using Steam, but yours should be a similar path. And the first file we're going to look at is the AI config file. Now for me, the only change that I make in AI config is to boost the AI scaling size multiplier from 1 to 1.3. An oversimplified explanation of this is that the existing enemy AI units are increased by 30%. For what we're trying to accomplish, I find the 30% increase to be exactly perfect. Um, this will boost the AI in all of the battles up until Shiloh, so Distress Call, First Bull Run, Logan's Crossroads, and River Crossing. You can go higher than 1.3 if you want to. I'll make mention um, as we get to each battle about some of the issues that you may run into if you boost it up higher than 1.3. Running out of ammo is definitely one of them. Things that you may want to consider changing in your own game. In the AI config file, if you want to change the size of the enemy units, you can do that here. You can also increase the chance to get duplicate units that you're fighting against. This is also a way to make the enemy army bigger without having larger units. However, it's not uh, always consistent from battle to battle. And if you get this cranked up too high in very large battles, I believe if you get over 256 units on the field combined between the Union and the Confederacy, you can actually crash the game. Now one of the things that we're trying to do is use our extra 30% enemy size to give us increased experience and increased weapons recovery. You could just go straight to weapons recovery percentage here and boost this up. Um, some people feel that if they do a full clear that uh, they deserve to have a larger spoils of war. If you're one of those people, this is where you would increase that. Um, I'm going to leave it at the base. If it's at zero, it'll run whatever the base is for the mod. The second file that I'm going to make a few changes to is the config file. And simply, there's just two things here. One is skip hints at the very end. I set that to true instead of the false. All that is, is there's a setting in the campaign setup uh, tick box that will shut off hints. And by doing it here, you don't have to remember to do that in your campaign setup. Because as far as I know, is once the campaign starts, there's no way of going back and changing that to turn it off. The other thing that I've done is set bypass recon to true. What this does, let me show you quick. It will tell you the number of enemy soldiers and guns. That's it. It doesn't give you any other additional information. It is not the same as actually having points in recon. All this does is give you an idea of what your scaling looks like. Um, it doesn't improve your spotting um, like points in recon would to do. And once you have two points in recon, this becomes useless. But early game, I want to be able to show everybody uh, what type of enemy unit size that we're facing with the extra 30%. And I can do that by bypassing recon. Other things that you might want to change in your game in the config file is you can change your army size. So... Right now, skirmisher max size is 750. If you would rather have skirmishers that go up to, say, 1,000, you could do that here. If you know that you play smaller and don't want to have infantry max size, you know, up to 6,000 for both you and the AI, well, then you could have 
drop this down to maybe 4,000 or 3,000 for yourself and also do it in the AI config file to drop them so you match up more appropriately. The other thing that you may want to change in the config file is Officer XP. And all three of them are displayed here, one for Brigade, one for Division, and one for Core. Um, I leave these as base because I find with the extra 30% that I get from killing larger units, my guys seem to promote quickly anyway. But if you want to uh, make that change, that's where you can do it here. The other thing that you could look at is with the mod, we've already discussed the fact that you have a chance for in, uh, enemy units to surrender or shatter. That also actually applies to your units if you get in trouble. But the default is a 19% chance to shatter when you're at zero morale and a 15% chance to surrender. So if you wanted to change those, you could change them here. Another part in the config file is timing. So there's three different timers you have up at the top here. Looking at the arrows, we have timer, mandatory, multiplier, timer, recommended multiplier, and they're both at 1.15. That's because the mod already gives you an extra 15% on your time. You also have an end of day multiplier, which is at 1.1. So the mod already gives you an extra 10%. Um, with setting things up as I have with the 1.3 for the AI unit size, the only one I really run into as far as time is river crossing, which people playing on regular uh, 1.0 AI also have problems sometimes with river crossing. Um, I can finish it um, within the time allowed, but you definitely have to be on the move and not playing around a lot. Um, but if you wanted to increase uh, the time for any of the battles, you could do that here. It's recommended that the top two timers be changed the same amount. So if you wanted to boost it up to one and a quarter, so you would change these to 1.25 each. And then an end of day timer should be just a little bit less than that. So maybe that becomes a 1.2. Uh, it's up to you how you want to do that. I do make one change in the unit modifiers and that is limbering switch distance. I drop down to 50. And the only thing this is, does is make my artillery limber earlier than later as far as how much distance I've told them to move. It irritates me when I've told multiple artillery units to move forward and maybe three out of four have limbered and they're making their way across to get set up wherever I want them to be and the fourth one decided not to limber and a couple of minutes into the game time I realized that they're trying to muscle those guns across the screen and are uh, wearing out their condition. And lastly, just for fun, you have an officer surname file. Um, I've added surnames of family, friends, and Civil War names that were missing. For example, Custer and Prentice are not anywhere in here. Oddly, if you click on historical battles or go to the custom battles, those guys show up. But in the default campaign, those names aren't there. So if you wanted to, you could... Uh, do a quick internet search to find which officers were at major battles as far as division commanders and things like that and add those last names here. There's also a file for first names, so you can't control what their first name is, is going to be, um, but at least it gets the last names in here. Let's go over career points and how you can spend them in the mod. Now, I have to admit, I only played the base game for about six months, so I don't even remember what the uh, base game does as far as the career points. Uh, but there's a lot more things that go on inside the mod. So on our way up to Shiloh, we're going to end up with a total of 10 career points from the campaign start when we set up. We're going to get two from Philippi, two from First Bull Run, and one from Distress Call, River Crossing and Logan's Crossroads. So that's going to give us a total of 17. We're going to end up with 10 in training, 6 in Army Organization, and 1 in Reconnaissance going up to Shiloh. So for politics, any points there obviously gives you more golden recruits. 
in the mod, you also get a resupply discount. This change becomes effective uh, with the next battle. Economy. You get a weapons discount. You also get an officer discount and a resupply discount. If you put points into economy, you have an immediate effect on weapons and officers. So you could drop a point in here and you immediately see when you go into the academy or into the shop for the armory that you'll see uh, cheaper weapons and officers. The resupply doesn't start until the next battle. With medicine, restores a percentage of unit losses. In the mod, it also reduces the probability of officers being killed or wounded. And the effect is with the beginning of the next battle. Training, pretty sure in the base game, the only thing that happens is it reduces the cost of your veterans. In the mod, and this is what we're taking advantage of, every point that we put in training increases our recruit stats, or actually re increases all recruit stats, by two. So if you have 10 in training, you'll have a max 20. Now this doesn't boost command because command is a reflection of your brigade officer and your division officer. But as far as morale, stamina, uh, firearms, anything related to what the unit is actually doing, that makes a difference. I should point out that this only becomes effective to recruits that come in after the next battle. So I've seen people that are new to the mod, you know, they put two points at the training and then they look up at their recruit stats and wonder why they didn't go up. Well, it only becomes effective to the new recruits that come in after the next battle. Um, and then they're averaged into the pool. Army organization determines the maximum size of your army and the units. It increases the maximum allowable supply. It also gives you a resupply discount. So anything related to the army and unit size and your max allowable su supply are immediate effects. The resupply discount uh, takes effect at the end of the next battle. For Shiloh, I'm trying to get this up to six. And the reason for that is because you could get away with only going up to five but Shiloh of all the battles in the entire game does some goofy things with how it deploys your units and I just find that on AO6 it's much easier to predict where your units are going to go or where they're going to start the battle which ones are going to be on the right flank which ones will be on the left flank and which ones will come in and reserve AO5 First off, you get fewer units on your left and right flanks to start, and it's harder pr to predict when those units will come in. Logistics. Increases the maximum allowable supply. It also increases your shop supply of all weapon types. You also get a resupply discount. It's important to understand when the effects of logistics happen. The uh, increased max supply is immediate and the resupply discount is after the next battle. But the shop stock multipliers only come into effect after major battles. So let's say that you decided, well, I'm not doing a training build, but I want to have heavy guns when I get to Shiloh. Well, you're going to have to crank this up fairly early because the only major battle between the game start and Shiloh is first ball run. So you're going to have to probably get three points in the logistics early. Uh, buy whatever heavy guns you want before first bull run. And then when it resets, you get more of them to buy after bull run before you get to Shiloh. Reconnaissance. So for every two points put in the reconnaissance, there are additional benefits as far as how much information you get on the enemy. You also, in the mod, get increased spotting. One of the things in Major General and even Legendary is that the AR skirmishers can be some pretty bad dudes. If you haven't noticed it before you get to Seven Pines, you will when you get there because that little three-star unit that they have can just chew you up all day. You need to be able to see the enemy units. I have a tendency to, with my first 
cavalry and skirmishers, I turn them into pickets just to max out spotting for those units. But of course, I'm relying on just unit perks to give me increased spotting. Anything that you put into reconnaissance gives all unit types increased spotting. So some people prefer to uh, go with this early. I don't pay any attention to this up to through Shiloh. And the AI doesn't use skirmishers at Shiloh. Thank goodness. But uh, I'll use a couple points after that I get with Shiloh to pump up reconnaissance uh, before I start into the side battles that lead up to Gaines Mill. So now we're going to start getting into our first camp. But one of the things I wanted to go over was I did a full clear of Philippi um, rather than just rushing to finish Philippi as quickly as I can. And I wanted to go over the reason for that because for me, with trying to get two-star units, it's all about getting as much as experience as I can. We have Scales, Loomis, Walton, and Woods here. So for efficiency at the top, unit efficiency, if I just finished Shiloh as quick as possible, would have been 37. Full clear gives me a 41. Morale for Scales, um, if I finish as soon as possible, is a 37. By full clear, I get a 40. Stamina goes from 46 up to 51. Firearms is the biggest jump, goes from 48 to 56. All total, that's 168 points versus 188 points. I didn't put melee down here because melee doesn't really change enough at this single battle to really make a difference. So that gives me an extra 20 points for scales. Since Loomis's unit has the lowest amount of experience, they have the greatest to gain as far as stat points in that battle. So they go up 30. Walton, since they're the most experienced unit that you have, have the least amount to gain by doing a full clear. So they only go up 13. Woods. Um, is the artillery, so they go up 18. So that gives me a total of 81 more stat points. So when I disband these units, I have 80 more, 81 more stat points that are going to go into that pool to help bump the average up of all the stats for everybody that will be in the pool. I am not expecting to deep dive every camp that I do um, as I play through. And that's because a lot of my units will be built in a similar way. So I'm going to discuss the potential unit perks for each unit type here and go over why I'm making those selections. Um, I'll show you what I do at each camp, but I don't think you need to watch the tediousness of slowly building those things. You just need to see the outcome. So let's look at skirmishers first. So tier one skirmishers. Um, when they get their first perk, you can either get pickets, light infantry, or musketry drills. So with pickets, I get 50% accuracy, I get 50% spotting, and I get 50% stealth. If I go with light infantry, I get the 35% speed and cover, which are both great. But early on, I don't have any spotting, and I don't have any improved accuracy. With musketry drills, I get 50% accuracy and minus 10% to my reload speed. Early on, my initial units are going to end up being pickets because I want the spotting. Um, the improved accuracy is a bonus. Stealth versus cover is kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Light infantry later on, um, I'll build some light infantry units uh, when I start building my army at Shiloh because I love these guys um, but early on I need the spotting so most of my early units are going to end up being pickets when we get to tier 2 and I've heard this name pronounced multiple ways depending on uh, what YouTube video you happen to be watching at the time the Zalv waves give you a 50% accuracy 40% cover you get some minus 10% reload or you can choose Scouch, which are another 50% accuracy, I get 50% spotting, and I get 50% stealth. So this becomes just a simple judgment call of do you want the cover or do you want the spotting? And I'll start dividing some of mine up. Um, usually the first skirmisher in my first division 
gets pickets and gets the spotting because I'm trying to max out that unit to be able to spot because that's their primary job is just to be able to see the battlefield and know when enemy skirmishers are coming in so my infantry doesn't get lit up. Other times I'll start to balance between so many of each. When we get to tier three, then we have modern infantry or you have sharpshooters. So with modern infantry, you get minus 10% to fire morale damage, minus 15% to melee morale damage, 500% rotation speed, and you get a minus 20 to your reload speed. Sharpshooters, sounds really cool because you get the 20% range, you get 20% cover, and you get 25% speed, but you reload 30% slower. I'll end up having a little bit of both in my units, depending on what I'm having them do. I don't mind having my long distance snipers get the sharpshooter perk. I like the extra cover and speed if they need to get out of uh, harm's way. And the slower reload is just a sacrifice that you have to make to have that long range. Some of my other units will end up taking the 20 minus 20% 20 reload speed just so they can fire faster. And I'll combine that with accuracy from pickets and scouts. But other than musketry drills, I really don't think that any of the skirmisher perks are bad. Um, you can end up with a mix or, you know, mix of any of these to build your units and not go wrong. Getting into the artillery perks, you have to understand how I use my artillery. Because if you are the type of player who's going to build dedicated smoothbores and dedicated rifles, you don't want to do it my way. Um, my artillery units, I swap these things out all the time. Um, a unit might have, you know, smoothbores for two battles and then on the third battle they've got rifles. I build them in such a way that they get benefits regardless of what type of gun that they have. It makes my units more flexible but they don't do the max damage in either smoothbore or rifle. So starting out with tier one we have improved shells which gives us a 25% to our shot shell damage and it gives us 5% range. We also have double canister, which gives us 25% canister and 40% cover. And then you have the bottom one, which is horse artillery, which gives you speed and rotation. I like the idea of having speed um, at certain points in the game. And when I am about halfway through the campaign, I might have a couple of these that I just pull out of reserves whenever I think I need them. But for the most part of the game, I don't need them. It's similar issue with canister, because you've got the three different ranges between canister, shot, and shell. Well, unless you turn your guns off so they only fire in canister, if you just leave them on and let them shoot, they're going to spend most of the time firing in shell and shot. And the other thing about canister is if somebody's close enough to a smoothbore to be in canister range, they're going to have a bad day. And it doesn't really matter what it is. Yeah, we kind of joke about the little, you know, six-pounder, little tiny smoothbore field gun. But I wouldn't want to be in front of it when it went off. And when you're looking at like a 24-pound howitzer, I mean, that thing does huge damage whether it has any bonuses or not. I mean, just the base gun in canister does massive damage. So on the tier one, I go with improved shells for all of my gun types. Uh, that gives me the 5% range plus the 25% to shot and shell because I just think that so much of your time is spent shooting in the shot range, which is the middle zone. For the tier 2 artillery perk, this is kind of a little uh, deceptive math going on here. And let me tell you what I'm talking about. So with fire direction, we get 25% accuracy and we get 50% spotting. In counter battery, you get 25% shot and shell damage and 50% stealth. And then with close combat, we get 25% canister damage and 100% cover. Well, in close combat, the 25% canister damage obviously is only in canister range. The 25% shot shell damage for counter battery is only in those ranges. But the 25% accuracy is through all three ranges. And when you do the math, it's exactly the same. So 
I take the fire direction. I don't think spotting is that great for your artillery. Usually they're located in a place that doesn't usually allow them to see the furthest anyway. But the 25% accuracy across all three range types just to me beats out any of the other ones. I suppose if you were doing dedicated smooth bores, the 100% cover might, you know, help you out. But I'm pretty sure after you've touched one of these things off three or four times, the enemy is going to know where you are anyway. So moving up to tier three, with rapid fire, you get the minus 15% reload and you get 25% speed. And that's the one I'll be taking. So for my artillery, I'll be taking improved shells with tier one, fire direction with tier two, and rapid fire with tier three. With tier three, you could take bombardment, which gives you another 10% range. And that comes with a 10% reload penalty. And if the game had player versus player aspects, I'd be really tempted to take the bombardment to try to outrange whoever I'm playing against. But the AI, the way it's set up now, it doesn't optimize its artillery range to begin with. So I rarely ever get into a position where I don't have superior range on those guys anyway. The AI has such a tendency to use ordnance rifles and 10 pound parrots. And of course, as a player, we're usually loading up on 20 pound parrots and siege guns. You have them outranged almost anything that they bring up anyway. So the bombardment just becomes an overkill and you're taking the reload penalty. So I take the, the faster speed with the faster reload. Taking a look at the cavalry perks. Cavalry, I would say every one of these perks is good depending on what you're doing with that unit. Um, none of these is a bad choice, okay? Um, and I will have a mixture of all of these. My first cavalry and first division will end up being scouts. And I'll make one of them, and it'll usually be in one of my first two divisions. When I make melee cavalry, then they will get discipline for the minus 10% fire morale and minus 15% melee morale damage. Later on, depending on what weapons I have available to me, I may make units that have musketry with the 50% accuracy in them and the reload bonus. For the tier two cavalry perks, you have scouting, you have saber proficiency, and you have carbine proficiency. I'll have a mixture of all those. Uh, probably my first division scouting unit will get scouting again just to give them the longer accuracy um, with a little bit of stealth. Uh, my melee cav will definitely be saber proficiency. Um, I found that Carbines and other types of weapons like that are much easier to come by than melee weapons for your cav. Sometimes you have, end up having a lot more scouting and carbine units just because there's not enough melee weapons to go around. When we get into tier 3, we have mounted infantry, which gives you a 20% range when dismounted with a 10% reload speed benefit. 25% cover, 25% accuracy. Um, I rarely ever use dismounted infantry, um, so I don't usually use this perk. Just about all of my guys end up getting the uh, shock for the charge and, and minus 10% melee morale damage. Even even my carbine units, because every, every cavalry type I have whether they were designed for melee or not, at some point are going to end up charging artillery and charging infantry or skirmisher units that are down to zero morale and just about ready to shatter. So by the time we get to that tier three perk for shock, that's what I get. But there'll be units that are a mix of all of these. Finally, we get into our infantry perks. And my infantry units will all get the same tier one and tier two perks. Tier three, depending on what I'm having them do or if I have specialty units, um, might get a combination of those. 
our tier one infantry perks. We have musketry and we have marching drills. So musketry gives us the 50% accuracy plus a reload bonus. Marching drills gives us 15% speed and 25% to charge. At tier two, we have musketry again, which gives us 50% accuracy. We get the 10% reload bonus and we get minus 10% fire morale damage. If we take bayonet, we get 15% speed, 15% charge, which is the same as the marching drills, but we get a minus 15% to melee morale damage. I don't use maneuver, which is the bottom one, which is 15% speed, 20% reload, and 500% rotation. So to me, before I played Major General, I pretty much took all accuracy. In Brigadier General, I took musketry and both of these for the accuracy perks. In Major General, I definitely want to have a melee perk. So I take one accuracy perk, one melee perk. So the question is, which one do you take first and in which order? Well, if you take accuracy first and then you take the melee perk second, your other part of bayonet is minus 15% melee morale damage. If you go with the melee perk first, they could use speed and charge, and then with tier two, you end up taking the accuracy perk, then you get the minus 10% fire morale damage. So whether you take accuracy first or second really comes down to, do you value the 15% melee morale damage more than the 10% fire morale damage? The way I look at it is if my guys are having fire morale damage issues, then shame on me for putting them in the wrong spot. So I prefer the 15% melee morale damage reduction because they're going to get melee morale issues when they're charging in melee. So to me, that has a lot more value. So I'll be doing musketry with tier one and bayonet with tier two. Tier three, I'll mostly be using sharpshooters for the additional accuracy cover and spotting if i have dedicated if i end up having dedicated melee units then i'll use elite for the speed reload and the reduced fire and melee morale damage let's talk about the barracks for just a moment the academy is populated with new officers after each uh, major grand battle and new officers are additive meaning that the old officers stay in the academy until they're hired. So we have Byron Pryor here at the top, who's a captain, for $1,095. If I don't use him, purchase him, when we get to at the end, when we get ready to invade Richmond, he'll still be sitting here waiting to get into the fray. Sometimes I see people buying up officers like crazy, and they just sit in reserve, and there's no reason for it, because these guys aren't going away. This is not like your armory where the shop resets and weapons disappear. The other thing you need to know in the mod is that captains can be assigned to any unit type. And as long as you have the funds, you can hire as many captains as you want. Even if you look in the academy and all of the captains are gone, if you just go to create a new unit, it'll automatically put another captain in here. So you'll never run out of captains as long as you've got money to buy them. Now the armory, unlike the barracks, this thing resets at every major battle, like the barracks, except it's not additive. New weapons available in the shop replace those that were previously there. Only weapons purchased and moved into the armory will remain after each battle. For example, by buying the 20 pound parrot here before the first grand battle, which is first bull run, this will result in that parrot moving into the armory and immediately following the battle, another one will appear in the shop for purchase. That's because I don't have anything in logistics. Uh, the other thing about logistics that you need to understand is that the rarer the weapon or uh, the better the gun in the artillery, the less of an effect the shot multiplier has. So the shot multiplier is going to give a lot more, you know, Springfield 42s and rebores than it's going to give you Whitworth, Sheez guns, parrots, 
howitzers. If you decide not to buy any of the heavy guns before first bull run, then all of these are still going to show up as a one. Actually, I think the howitzer bumps up to a two. Two available after first bull run. Um, but if you buy these, they'll all reset and there'll be another one available to buy. All right, let's get this army built and on our way to distress call. But before we disband anything, let's take a look at our recruit stats. Right now we've got uh, 24 for efficiency, 22 for morale, 24 for stamina, 25 for firearms, and 24 for melee. I'm going to put one career point into AO and one into training. We're going to buy the SP-55s. We're going to buy the three-inch ordnance rifles with our reputation points. We're also going to buy this officer, who was so close to being the major general already. Put him in charge of our first corps. Give him an accuracy perk. We'll put our avatar in charge of first division. Disband woods. Disband Loomis. Disband scales. Before we disband Walton, we're going to buy about $40,000 worth of vets. This is going to help pump up our stats for the recruits when we disband these guys. Now, when we disband Walton, we see we've got a 30 for efficiency, 31 for morale, 34 for stamina, 34 for firearms, and a 29 for melee. So some of those went up uh, almost 10 points because the highest number we had before was 24. And uh, firearms and stamina are up to 34 each. Melee still at 29. I think that was around 23 or 24. But with those stats, that gives us enough to uh, start building one-star units, even with captains. We'll put $10,000 into our supply. I know this is going to sound like blasphemy to some of you guys, but we are actually going to disband once again after Distress Call. Going into Distress Call, I'm trying to get as many soldiers as possible out of their recruit pool onto the field. But since I don't have anything put into logistics, I have the minimum available weapons in all categories. Right now, the deployment screen for the stress call is incorrect. It says that you can only deploy 10 units there. You can actually deploy 12. So you can send 12 to the stress call, 12 to uh, first ball run, and 14 into the two side battles before Shiloh. But that's only if you get enough points to where you can have uh, uh, three divisions in AO before you go on the distress call. We're not going to do that. We're just going to go with the two divisions and build them up the best we can. We're going to make one brigade of our smoothbores, one brigade of our rifles.
We'll get two brigades out of our 1841 Mississippis. One of the things that you run into when you're doing a training build early is having quality officers. You know, when if you don't do a training build, you can throw captains in here and their efficiency isn't high anyway, so it's no problem. So it doesn't really matter what rank your division commanders are. But when you start making one stars right out the gate, um, you can take some pretty good efficiency hits if your division commanders aren't high enough. Even though we're paying full price because we don't have anything in economy, I go ahead and spend money on officers. We'll make this a bigger unit and put all of those guns into one division. Because I have so few Springfield 61s, I tend to give those to skirmishers early on in the campaign. And the problem with skirmishers and cavalry, they have the same problem. And that if you give them too low on an officer, they take an efficiency hit. I mean, we just give them a lieutenant colonel and we still have a small efficiency hit. If we did give them a captain, it would have been much worse. Well, that gives us the 10 that we're going to take. We're going to make these guys pickets. We'll make these guys pickets. I gave my smooth bore the uh, canister just for this battle, knowing that they're going to get disbanded again, because the next time I make them, before going in the first bull run, they'll get the other uh, rifle-based perk. All my infantry are going to get uh, accuracy perks. Do a quick save. I try to always save a pre camp and post camp for every battle. And we're ready to rock. I will see you at distress call. <laughs>